All right, we're rolling. I'm here with Steve Kusaba, who has a, a grand project. Do you want to tell me about it? Yes. This project is a 47-hour Omni musical and has some key themes in it. And one of the, uh, it's, it's about the advent of life and man and the rights of man and the, and the reverence toward life. And what's the name of this project? It's the Centrifugal Zotzclaw. Great clock, synchronizing bell, ring in the parts all move. True clock, mystifying tell, clue if it's dark or light. Send all the players hurrying to go. It examines the modern ruling structures and how they interact with people. And it mostly has sort of a message of hope where that in some place people might be able to live freely and not be so stifled by the ruling class. So uh, would you characterize it as a, a political work? It's very political and, and very spiritual in a sense. What would you say, um, who would you say are your major musical influences? Well this is Omni and I'd have to say that it incorporates every name classical composer. There's homages to all of them, little quotes to, of their style, and what they would say, and pop music and jazz. And music. It's music that's about all music, that no, 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 no style can be left out. And a lot of uh, textures leak into each other, so there's textures from many different styles, and then writing uh, procedures of certain styles superimposed into other textures, so it, it very much bleeds into, uh, into each other, so that it's a very modern, liquefactious sound. And that is this, that before we decide either to save the planet or to destroy it, we pause for a moment of silence. I mean real silence, in which we stop thinking and experience reality as reality is. 
because after all, if I talk all the time, I can't hear what anyone else has to say. If I think all the time, I have nothing to think about except thoughts. And so I'm never in touch with the real world. Now, what is the real world? Some people have the theory that the real world is material or physical. I say it's made a kind of a stuff. Other people have the theory that the real world is spiritual or mental. But I want you to point out that both those theories of the world are concepts. They are constructions of words. And the real world is not an idea. It is not words. Reality is... confuse ourselves as living organisms with our idea of ourselves. That is to say with a conception of myself which is called the personality or ego. We, that is what we have been told we are. And it's an extremely crude and limited conception of oneself of the actual unique living organism. And we get unhappy because we are thinking of ourselves in this way because we think, well, gee, I'm going to die. You're not that. Then another thing that bothers, bothers us is time. Most people nowadays say, I have no time. Of course you don't. Because you are not aware of the present. Now, the present is the only real time. There is no past. And there isn't a future. And there never will be. We think ordinarily of the present as an infinitesimal point at which the future changes into the past. And we also do a terrible thing. We imagine ourselves to be results of the past. We don't realize that the past is caused by the present as the wake of a ship flows back from the prow. Now the wake doesn't drive the ship any more than the tail wags the dog. But the truth of the matter is, it all begins here. This is where the creation begins. And you're doing it, and won't admit it. Because, of course, you're all God in disguise. Jesus found that out, and they crucified him for saying so. So, you, this is a very odd thing for Westerners to understand, and particularly for Americans because we are so fixated on the future. When we say we want to put something down, we say it has no future. Well, do you? Much better to have a present. Because if you don't, it's useless to make plans. Because when they work out, you won't be there to enjoy them. You'll be thinking of something else. So we don't le we realize that we are living out of now and throwing the past behind us.
The basic state of consciousness valued by our society, which I would call the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness, which is good for the more mundane aspects of science, it's good for the prosecution of warfare, it's good for commerce, it's good for politics, but I think everybody realises that the promise of a society over-monopolistically based upon this state of consciousness has proved hollow, and that this model is no longer working that it's broken in every possible sense that a model can be broken and that urgently we need to find something to replace it. The vast problems of global pollution that have resulted from the single-minded pursuit of, of profit, the, the horrors of, of nuclear proliferation, the spectre of, of, of hunger that millions every night go to bed starving, that we can't even solve this problem despite our alert problem-solving state of consciousness. And look what's happening in the Amazon, the lungs of our planet, this precious home of biodiversity. The old-growth rainforest being cut down and replaced with soya bean farms so we can feed cattle so that we can all eat hamburgers. Only a truly insane global state of consciousness could allow such an abomination to occur. And I did a back-of-an-envelope calculation during the Iraq War it seems to me that six months expenditure on the Iraq war would have solved the problem of the Amazon forever. Would be sufficient to compensate the peoples of the Amazon so that no single tree ever needed to be cut down again to garden and, and look after that amazing resource. But we can't make that decision as a global community. We can spend countless billions on warfare, on hatred, on fear, on suspicion, on division, but we can't get the, together the collective effort to save the lungs of our planet. And I stand here invoking the hard-won right of freedom of speech to call for and demand another right to be recognized, and that is the right of adult sovereignty over consciousness. There's a war on consciousness in our society, and if we as adults are not allowed to make sovereign decisions about what to experience with our own consciousness while doing no harm to others, then we cannot claim to be free in any way. And it's useless for our society to go around the world imposing our form of democracy on others while we nourish this rot at the heart of society and we do not allow individual freedom over consciousness. It may even be that we're denying ourselves the next vital step in our own evolution by allowing this state of affairs to continue.
George Ruddy died today. Edward George Ruddy was the chairman of the board of the Union Broadcasting Systems, and he died at 11 o'clock this morning of a heart condition, and woe is us. We're in a lot of trouble. So, a rich little man with white hair died. What has that got to do with the price of rice, right? And why is that woe to us? Because you people and 62 million other Americans are listening to me right now. Because less than 3% of you people read books. Because less than 15% of you read newspapers. Because the only truth you know is what you get over this tube. Right now, there is a whole, an entire generation that never knew anything that didn't come out of this tube. This tube is the gospel, the ultimate revelation. This tube can make or break presidents, popes, prime ministers. This tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. And woe is us if it ever falls into the hands of the wrong people. And that's why woe is us that Edward George Ruddy died. Because this company is now in the hands of CCA, the Communication Corporation of America. There's a new chairman of the board, a man called Frank Hackett, sitting in Mr. Ruddy's office on the 20th floor. And when the 12th largest company in the world controls the most awesome goddamn propaganda force in the whole godless world, who knows what shit will be peddled for truth on this network? So you listen to me. Listen to me. Television is not the truth. Television is a goddamn amusement park. Television is a circus, a carnival, a traveling troupe of acrobats, storytellers, dancers, singers, jugglers, sideshow freaks, lion tamers, and football players. We're in the boredom-killing business. So if you want the truth, go to God. Go to your gurus. Go to yourselves, because that's the only place you're ever going to find any real truth. But, man, you're never going to get any truth from us. We'll tell you anything you want to hear. We lie like hell. We'll tell you that uh, Kojak always gets the killer and that nobody ever gets cancer in Archie Bunker's house. And no matter how much trouble the hero is in, don't worry, just look at your watch. At the end of the hour, he's going to win. We'll tell you any shit you want to hear. We deal in illusions, man. None of it is true. But you people sit there day after day, night after night, all ages, colors, creeds. We're all you know. You're beginning to believe the illusions we're spinning here. You're beginning to think that the tube is reality and that your own lives are unreal. You do whatever the tube tells you. You dress like the tube. You ate like the tube. You raise your children like the tube. You even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. So turn off your television sets. Turn them off now. Turn them off right now. Turn them off and leave them off. Turn them off right in the middle of the sentence I'm speaking to you now. Turn them off. You know, Doug Casey has said that every day the politicians go to great lengths to show how much they really hate you <laughs> in their actions. I've never seen anybody refute this. I, I've, I haven't seen anybody, these assertions today stand. I mean, nobody said anything about it. You know, the handmaidens of these top dwelling creatures are the major media, news and entertainment organizations. <clears throat> you know, and they accomplish a lot of what they do through omission. And a lot of a lot of very smart people are lulled to sleep by this. They have the expectation that if something were amiss in society or in the nation or anything, that the media would be there to let them know. So when things are happening, they assume that these things will be uh, quite reasonable, you know, so. But, you know, it's a sad set of situations, but because they do, there are biases that are really heavy 
because of ownership issues. The media is not what it used to be. It's very, very concentrated. And the multi-voice panoply of thousands of organizations, well, that's dried up. And, you know, if all of a sudden John Palmer falls out of a two-story building and, you know, and they report on that, yeah, they will tend to get the details right. Well, I mean, some of the time they'll get that right. And, but when they talk about larger issues, you'll get, a, you'll get an impression by the way they talk about them. And uh, it'll be a circumstance where, like, everybody will view things that we have a left, we have a right, this is one's team and this is the other team. And they go fight each other because they see things differently. And you should pick one of those sides because one of those sides will be working for you. Yeah. But never mind that, you know, frequently both sides will be in collusion. Okay. And they'll be working for, you know, uh, lining their own pockets and doing things that work for them. In fact, their supporters frequently are the people be, that they're that the two parties are feeding off of as they go against each other and they they love getting everyone mad at each other on the two teams because it's all, that means you must support one of the sides of the duopoly and so a large number of people find themselves misled um they don't know what to believe uh unable to to discern truth from the world and there's a reason for that. And terrible is the word witnesses used to describe the scene of the plane crash in western Pennsylvania. United Airlines Flight 93 was en route from Newark, New Jersey to San Francisco when it was apparently hijacked. That 757 crashed about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. There were 45 people on board. Virginia Congressman Jim Moran was briefed by the Marine Corps on that crash. Moran says the plane was apparently headed for Camp David, the president's retreat in western Maryland. The plane crashed about 85 miles northwest of Camp David. The debris here is spread over a three to four mile radius, which has now been completely sealed off and is being treated, according to the FBI, as a crime scene. Um, Governor Tom Ridge made some remarks earlier at a press conference. Uh, he had flown over the site. He said the emergency response here was immediate. He also said, and I don't know whether or not you all are able to see pictures of this, but this is one of those cases where the pictures really do tell the story that sort of the most horrifying aspect of this particular crash scene is how little debris is visible. There is a large crater in the ground, and I'm hoping that you all are seeing it as I'm talking about it. But that's really all you see is a large crater in the ground and, and just tiny, tiny bits of debris. There has been at least one report that the uh, investigators out there, and there are hundreds of them, as I said tonight, um, have found nothing larger than a phone book. I want to get qu uh, quickly to Chris Kanicki. He's a photographer with the uh, Pittsburgh affiliate of Fox Affiliate. He was back there just a couple of minutes ago, and Chris, I've seen the pictures. It looks like there's nothing there except for a hole in the ground. Uh, basically, that's right. The only thing you could see from where we were uh, was a big gouge in the earth and some broken trees. We could see some people working, walking around in the area, but from where we could see, there wasn't much left. Any large pieces of debris at all? No, there was nothing, nothing that you could distinguish that a plane had crashed there. Smoke, fire? Nothing. It was absolutely quiet. It was uh, actually very quiet. Um, Nothing going on down there, no smoke, no fire, just a couple of people walking around. They look like part of the NTSB crew walking around looking at the pieces. How big would you say that hole was? Uh, from my estimates, I would guess it was probably about 20 to 15 feet uh, long and a, probably about 10 feet long or 10 feet wide. What could you see on the ground, if anything, other than dirt and ash? And You couldn't see anything. You could just see dirt, ash, and people walking around, broken trees. And Nancy, the fourth hijacked plane went down about an hour and a half from Pittsburgh. Yes, and a former intern here at LEX 18, Gail Wilson, now teaches at a university near there. I spoke with Gail about the panic and hysteria there. The NBC station in Pittsburgh just reported about five minutes ago that a 911 call was made from the plane that crashed. The caller said, this is not a hoax, this is not a hoax, this is Flight 93 from United, we've been hijacked. 
How do the terrorists take control of the plane? The Mayday call audio is less than one minute long. The 9-11 Commission concluded that all four hijackers rushed the cockpit at once. I'm John Jarvis, the director of the National Park Service, and I am humbled to be here this morning with the families of the heroes of Flight 93 to dedicate this memorial to your loved ones. Ten years ago, Flight 93 took off from Newark, New Jersey, bound for San Francisco. Terrorists hijacked that plane and three others that terrible day as part of an organized attack on this country. The hijackers turned the plane towards Washington, D.C., aimed, we believe, at the United States Capitol, where both the House and the Senate were in session. They never made it. Because of the determination and valor of the passengers and crew of Flight 93, that plane crashed in this field, less than 20 minutes by air from its presumed target. This memorial is to 40 remarkable people. In less than 30 minutes, they understood their situation, voted on what to do, and acted. Each of them is an American hero. Laura and I are honored to join you in dedicating this memorial to the heroes of Flight 93. When the sun rose in the Pennsylvania sky 10 years ago tomorrow, it was a peaceful September morning. By the time it set, nearly 3,000 people were gone. The most lives lost on American soil in a single day since the Battle of Antietam. With the distance of a decade, 9-11 can feel like a part of a different era. But for the families of the men and women stolen, some of whom joined us today, that day will never feel like history. And then there's the extraordinary story we commemorate here. Aboard United Airlines Flight 93 with college students from California, an iron worker from New Jersey, veterans of the Korean War and World War II, citizens of Germany and Japan, a pilot who had rearranged his schedule so that he could take his wife on a vacation to celebrate their anniversary. When the passengers and crew realized the plane had been hijacked, they reported the news calmly. When they learned that the terrorists had crashed other planes into targets on the ground, they accepted greater responsibilities. In the back of the cabin, the passengers gathered to devise a strategy. At the moment America's democracy was under attack, our citizens defied their captors by holding a vote. The choice they made would cost them their lives, and they knew it. Many passengers called their loved ones to say goodbye, then hung up to perform their final act. One said they're getting ready to break into the cockpit. I have to go. I love you. Another said it's up to us. I think we can do it. In one of the most stirring accounts, Todd Beamer, a father of two with a pregnant wife at home in New Jersey, asked the airphone operator to join him in reciting the Lord's Prayer. Then he helped lead the charge to the front of the plane with the words, let's roll. With their selfless act, the men and women who stormed the cockpit lived out the words, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And with their brave decision, they launched the first counteroffensive of the war on terror. The most likely target of the hijacked plane was the United States Capitol. We'll never know how many innocent people might have been lost. But we do know this. Americans are alive today because the passengers and crew of Flight 93 chose to act. And our nation will be forever grateful. States. Now, you and the president had earlier discussed rules of engagement for taking down a hijacked airplane, but you were the one who gave the direct order to shoot down a plane that you were told, as it turns out incorrectly, was headed for Washington. Right. That's correct. You were the one who gave the direct order to shoot down a plane 
that you were told, as it turns out incorrectly, was headed for Washington. Right. That's correct. What's that moment like? Well, um, it was necessary. And uh, it was a, uh, frankly, I didn't uh, pause to think about it very much. But frankly, I didn't uh, pause to think about it very much because once one of those aircraft became, it was hijacked, it was a weapon. Uh, we'd seen already um, by that time three of them go in to the Pentagon and the World Trade Center in New York. As a result, thousands died. And if we had been in a position to intercept one of those to keep it from striking its target, would we have done it? Absolutely. And what I did was pass on the uh, president's uh, approval uh, of the basic proposition that we would, in fact, uh, authorize our people to shoot down aircraft that had been hijacked and uh, refuse to divert. So I, I saw it as part of my responsibility, but I, I did it quickly because uh, we had a lot of other things we were doing at the same time. We have a sense if we imagine the kind of world we would face if the people who bombed the death hall in Mosul or the people who did the bombing in Spain, or the people who attacked the United States in New York, shot down the plane over Pennsylvania, attacked the Pentagon, shot down the plane over Pennsylvania, shot down the plane over Pennsylvania, attacked the Pentagon. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center. There was smoke everywhere, people were jumping out the windows. I can't imagine anything worse than this. This doesn't happen in America. I guess it does. Today, we've had a national tragedy. Well, good evening. President Bush is vowing to track down and punish the individuals, the organizations, the countries responsible for this. Tonight, enormous lights are shining down on a big gash in the side of the Pentagon. Smoke is still rising from the rooftop. As rescuers press on after a day of diabolical terror, hijacked planes piercing the World Trade Center in New York, slamming into the Pentagon in Washington, and crashing into a Pennsylvania field, President Bush says, gravely, the U.S. is standing with steely resolve against evil. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. The explosions begin at 8.42 a.m. Eastern Time. Hijackers, armed with knives, direct an American Airlines plane into one tower of the 110-story Trade Center. 21 minutes later, a United plane slices through the other tower. At 9.40 a.m., hijackers send an American flight, smashing into the Pentagon. Back in New York, one tower of the Trade Center collapses. A minute later, a United flight nosedives southeast of Pittsburgh. Finally, at 10.28, the other Trade Center tower falls. The dead, and there could be thousands, include workers in the buildings, police and firefighters sent to help them, as well as the 266 aboard the planes. Government and corporate buildings across the U.S. are evacuated, including the White House and the Capitol. Airports are shut down. Terrorism experts say Osama bin Laden is the most likely suspect, although bin Laden supporters deny responsibility. I want to be clear, because I've heard you say this, but it, and I've heard the president say it, but I want you to say it for my listeners, which is that the White House has never argued that Saddam was directly involved in September 11th, correct? That's correct. We had uh, one report early on from another intelligence service that suggested uh, that uh, the lead hijacker, Mohammed Atta, had met with Iraqi intelligence officials in Prague, Czechoslovakia. Um, and that reporting waxed and waned with a degree of confidence in it and so forth has been pretty well knocked down now at this stage. But uh, So we've never made the case or argued the case that somehow Osama bin Laden was directly involved in 9-11. That evidence uh, has never been forthcoming. Um, but there, that's a separate proposition from the question of whether or not there was some kind of a relationship between the Iraqi government, Iraqi intelligence services, and uh, the uh, Al-Qaeda organization. Osama bin Laden is the world's most wanted terrorist. Many to violate the bin Laden terrorist organization. Osama bin Laden is the most wanted man in the world. I want justice. And uh, uh, there's an old poster out west, as I recall, that said, wanted, dead or alive. If you go to the FBI website, they've got Osama bin Laden. And if you go to Osama bin Laden's webpage on the FBI most wanted terrorist list, 
we find that he's been indicted for the 1998 attacks, but not for 9-11. And in fact, a number of journalists called up the FBI and said, well, look, why have you not connected bin Laden to 9-11? And they said, well, I'm afraid we just don't have the evidence. This, you know, this is something that uh, is new to all of our experience. We think, we think, what? What do we think? Chad, one of our reporters is reporting that bin Laden may be dead. Bin Laden? Maybe. May, no, I, I, I will not report, no. Come on. but I will say that it is possible that the terror mastermind who killed so many Americans striking from his bases in Afghanistan, Osama bin Laden, something may have happened to him. And when it comes to weighing the devil in Libya with the devil in Afghanistan, I'm telling you, we've got a much stronger beef and a much more profoundly important national security interest in seeing the terror mastermind who killed so many Americans on September 11, 2001, finally exiting the scene. Maybe he's gone on. Wouldn't that be nice? And again, this is not a fact. I am not reporting it as a fact. But wouldn't that be nice if it were that? So we've never made the case or argued the case that somehow Osama bin Laden was directly involved in 9-11. That evidence uh, has never been forthcoming. Jennifer Griffin on the phone with us right now. Jen Dahl, I've never been happier to be on the show with you uh, than I am right now. Tell us what you know. Well, Geraldo, what we know at this point is that uh, he was killed reportedly by a U.S. bomb over a week ago. They were waiting for our DNA results to match the body to be sure that, in fact, they had gotten him. <laughs> and now uh, we can report that Osama bin Laden is dead, uh, killed by a U.S. missile. Um, we're not clear of the location. I'm still getting more details. Uh, but as I reported earlier, there were uh, intelligence folks that I've been speaking to. They've all been called into their operations centers. Uh, they're waiting for people to get into position before the president is going to speak. Again, as Chad mentioned, they want to be on the same page, but uh, this is a huge announcement. I don't need to tell you. It's, it's uh, ironic that you're on the air right now. I remember those days in Tora Bora where you were hot on its heels. And uh, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al Qaeda and a terrorist who's responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. And on nights like this one, we can say to those families who have lost loved ones to Al-Qaeda's terror, justice has been done. From Times Square to Ground Zero to the White House, the familiar chant of USA, USA resonated as citizens learned that Osama bin Laden was dead. The announcement sparked immediate jubilation. In Times Square, people gathered around giant news tickers to see the latest updates and take in the moment they heard the world's most wanted terrorist was dead. At the White House, young Americans climbed trees, climbed the light post, donned American flags, and belted the national anthem. The feeling out here is euphoric as thousands of Americans gather in front of the White House for just hours ago. U.S. President Barack Obama made the announcement that Osama bin Laden is dead. For many, it became a moment of reflection, thinking back to the nearly 3,000 lives lost on September 11, 2001, an act of terror Osama bin Laden claimed responsibility for. I think a lot of us have grown up with the memory of 9-11 and sort of with this constant notion of a threat uh, and of danger of terrorism. So I think that this is a very triumphant moment for all of us. Patriotism filled the air outside the White House into the early hours of Monday morning. Two hours after the announcement, with celebrations still roaring, the U.S. Secret Service brought in barriers to push back revelers from the White House. Gatherers said the importance of this historical moment reaches beyond the gates of the White House. See, this is a very important moment for not only the USA, but the entire world. Many world leaders are praising the achievement of the U.S. military, That's but they are cautioning the death of bin Laden does elevate security risks around the world.
back at the White House, the focus remains on the justice the president said was delivered. Julianne McKellogg, VOA News, Washington. But uh, so we've never made the case or argued the case that somehow Osama bin Laden was directly involved in 9-11. That evidence uh, has never been forthcoming. Understanding uh, how the Hegelian dialectic applies uh, when it comes to uh, perception management, which is just a fancy word for PR, um, you can begin to understand that every message, every product is sold to you. Um, and everything is a product, and your politicians are no different, and your policies are no different, and your civil rights issues are no different. These are all things that feed the dialectic, and they distract and detract um, from the, uh, the truth. The Galian dialectics refers to a particular dialectical method of argument employed by the 19th century German philosopher G.W.F. Hegel. Dialectics is a term used to describe a method of philosophical argument that relies on a contradictory process between opposing sides. The basis of Hegelianism dictates that the human mind can't understand anything unless it can be split into two polar opposites. Good versus evil, right versus wrong, on left versus right. For example, when people are talking about two political parties, labor or liberal, republican or democrat, what they're actually referring to without realizing it is the thesis and the antithesis based off the Hegelian dialectic. The only real debate that occurs is just the minor differences between those two parties. Nothing is said or done about the issues that neither left nor right is discussing. Another form of Hegelian dialectic is problem, reaction, solution. Most of us unwittingly fall victim to it, and often, and sadly, if we do not stop, we will continue to lose our free will and liberties. It has been widely used by our governments and corporations around the world. You could say that in terms of controlling the masses and society in general, its deployment has been an effective tool in keeping humanity in check. Almost all major events in history employ the Hegelian dialectic of problem, manufacture a crisis, and take advantage or take advantage of one that is already in place in order to get the desired reaction of the public outcry where be the public demands a solution which has been predetermined from the beginning. Anytime a major problem or issue arises in society, think about who will gain or profit from it. Then remove yourself from the equation and take a step back. Look at it from a third party perspective. See the so-called problem. Look at who is reacting, why and in what way. Then look who is offering the solution. Hegelian thinking affects our entire society and political structure. The Hegelian dialectic is the framework for guiding our thoughts and actions in the conflicts that lead us to a predetermined solution. Hegelian thinking is built within our entire social and political structure. And it is as a tool used to control perceptions within society. The Galian dialectic, as we know it today, is used to dupe citizens into surrendering their sovereignty in small chunks over time, while convincing them that they are actually empowering themselves. Let's apply Hegelian dialectic to the gun control debate. Just as an example, the thesis is innocent people are murdered with guns. The antithesis, ban guns. Synthesis, or synthesis, ban certain types of guns or gun accessories make guns harder to buy. Understanding that the same process will be repeated over time so that many small tactical victories contribute to a larger strategic victory. The first resulting synthesis becomes the thesis the next time the Hegelian dialectic is employed. While it's true that Hegel wrote about dialectics as a process, he never actually mentions the words thesis, antithesis, or synthesis. In his writings, Hegel instead used terms like concrete, absolute, and universal to make his concepts a little more simpler and easier to digest. The triad thesis became closely associated with Hegel because critics and other readers found it easier to convey his thoughts using the triad thesis. 
not because he ever used or invented it. The first mention of those words was made by uh, the German philosopher Kant, and later the triad thesis was greatly expanded upon by Fitch, using three words as the backbone. Thesis, the moment of understanding, the antithesis, the dialectical moment, and the synthesis, the speculative moment. Dialectics is a process. It is essential for human beings to understand because in actuality most of us think or carry out arguments through this process. We make use of dialectics all the time, but it happens subconsciously. And so, you know, the media is, is one place where that all starts and all comes together, you know, and it's controlling the rhetoric. It's it's the Hegelian dialectic to, to create the uh, both sides of the argument and control both sides of the argument, to control the rhetoric, means you will always win. You will always be able to push forth your agenda as a solution, uh, regardless of whether it's an actual solution or whether it's something that causes much harm. Take, for example, uh, you know, the Gulf War and, and Bush uh, pushing us into, uh, into the Gulf. Uh, was was all about their agenda and and everything about it was a lie and and those lies created not just complacency but those lies uh, reinforced the uh, the ruling class to the point that uh, you know Bush went from being a very unpopular guy to a super popular president um, simply because we invaded another country based on false premise the rest of the world shunned it ah. But our entire society was like, let's go bomb some folk, you know, let's kill some folk, let's annihilate some people. They were intending to destroy us. They were known terrorists and all of these accusations and, and none of them, none of them uh, held any merit. The Soviet Union has been busy. They've been busy in terms of their level of effort. They've been busy in terms of the actual weapons that they've been producing. They've been busy in terms of expanding production rates. They've been busy in terms of expanding their institutional capability to produce additional weapons at additional rates. They've been busy in terms of expanding their capability to in, in increasingly improve the sophistication of those weapons. Year after year after year, they've been demonstrating that they have steadiness of purpose, that they're purposeful about what they're doing. Now, your question is, what, what ought one to be doing about that? They couldn't say that the Soviets had acoustic means of picking up American submarines. Because they couldn't find it. Because they couldn't find it. So they said, well, maybe they have a non-acoustic means of making our submarine fleet vulnerable. But there was no evidence that they had a non-acoustic thing. They're saying, we can't find that they're doing it the way that everyone thinks they're doing it. So they must be doing it a different way. We don't know what that different way is, but they must be doing it. Even though there's no evidence? Even though there was no evidence. So they're saying that that the fact that a weapon doesn't exist doesn't mean it doesn't exist it just means that we haven't found it now let me say to all of you here as all of you know the weightiest decision any president ever has to make is to send our troops in the harm's way and force can never be the first answer but sometimes it's the only answer you are the best prepared, best equipped, best trained fighting force in the world. And should it prove necessary for me to exercise the option of force, your commanders will do everything they can to protect the safety of all the men and women under their command. No military action, however, is risk-free. I know that the people we may call upon in uniform are ready. The American people have to be ready as well. Dealing with Saddam Hussein requires constant vigilance. We have seen that constant vigilance pays off, but it requires constant vigilance. Since the Gulf War, we have pushed back every time Saddam has posed a threat. When Baghdad plotted to assassinate former President Bush, we struck hard at Iraq's intelligence headquarters. When Saddam threatened another invasion by massing his troops in Kuwait along the Kuwaiti border in 1994, we immediately deployed our troops, our ships, our planes, and Saddam backed down. When Saddam forcefully occupied Erbil in northern Iraq, we broadened our control over Iraq's skies by extending the no-fly zone. 
But there is no better example, again I say, than the UN weapons inspection system itself. Yes, he has tried to thwart it in every conceivable way, but the discipline, determination, year in, year out effort of these weapons inspectors is doing the job, and we seek to finish the job. Let there be no doubt we are prepared to act. But Saddam Hussein could end this crisis tomorrow simply by letting the weapons inspectors complete their mission. He made a solemn commitment to the international community to do that and to give up his weapons of mass destruction a long time ago now. I call now on the distinguished Secretary of State of the United States of America, His Excellency, Mr. Colin Powell. Thank you, Mr. President. One of the most worrisome things that emerges from the thick intelligence file we have on Iraq's biological weapons is the existence of mobile production facilities used to make biological agents. Let me take you inside that intelligence file and share with you what we know from eyewitness accounts. We have first-hand descriptions of biological weapons factories on wheels and on rails. The trucks and train cars are easily moved and are designed to evade detection by inspectors. In a matter of months, they can produce a quantity of biological poison equal to the entire amount that Iraq claimed to have produced in the years prior to the Gulf War. As uh, Director Tennant has pointed out, Secretary Powell presented evidence last week that Baghdad has failed to disarm its weapons of mass destruction, willfully attempting to evade and deceive the international community. Our particular concern is that Saddam Hussein may supply terrorists with biological, chemical, or radiological material. In the four years since the inspectors left, intelligence reports show that Saddam Hussein has worked to rebuild his chemical and biological weapons stock, his missile delivery capability, and his nuclear program. He has also given aid, comfort, and sanctuary to terrorists, including Al-Qaeda members. I take the threat very seriously. I take the fact that he develops weapons of mass destruction very seriously. I remember the fact that he has invaded two countries before. I know for a fact that he's poisoned his own people. He doesn't believe in the worth of each individual. He doesn't believe in public dissent. But we can't let the world's worst leaders blackmail, threaten, hold freedom-loving nations hostage with the world's worst weapons. Eleven years ago, as a condition for ending the Persian Gulf War, the Iraqi regime was required to destroy its weapons of mass destruction, to cease all development of such weapons, and to stop all support for terrorist groups. The Iraqi regime has violated all of those obligations. Yes. I think you can make the case Hypothetically, very theoretically, you can make the case that there are occasions that might require preemptive action. That's why I say, give us the facts, give us a far better appreciation of the circumstances involving Iraq, and that may be one of them. But uh, that case has not been made so far. There are a lot of people who lie and get away with it. And, uh, and that uh, we will in fact find um, uh, weapons or, or evidence of weapons programs that are, are conclusive. I don't think we'll discover anything myself. It appears that there were not weapons of mass destruction there. You said you knew where they were. I did not. We know where they are. They're in the area around uh, Tikrit and Baghdad and, and uh, east, west, south and north. Well, first of all, I, I have it lied. There are a lot of people who lie and get away with it. 
talking about lies and your your what? allegation that there was bulletproof evidence of ties between Al Qaeda and Iraq. Was that a lie? Intelligence gathered by this and other governments leaves no doubt that the Iraqi regime continues to possess and conceal some of the most lethal weapons ever devised. The, our people are going to find out the truth, and the truth will say that this intelligence is good intelligence, no doubt in my mind. Uh, I don't know anybody that I can think of who has contended that the Iraqis had nuclear weapons. And we believe he has, in fact, reconstituted nuclear weapons. Saddam Hussein is determined to get his hands on a nuclear bomb. We cannot wait for the final proof. He's got him. He's got him. The smoking gun. He's got him. That could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Colin Powell didn't lie. My colleagues, every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. He has not developed any significant capability with respect to weapons of mass destruction. He is unable to project conventional power against his neighbors. Are people going to find out the truth? I have not suggested there's a connection between Iraq and the 9-11. You have said in the past that it was, quote, pretty well confirmed. No, I never said that. Okay. I, I never think said that, that is... No, absolutely not. What I said was, uh, it's been pretty well confirmed, that he did go to Prague and he did meet with um, a senior official of the Iraqi intelligence service. Saddam Hussein aids and protects terrorists, including members of Al-Qaeda. Secretly and without fingerprints, he could provide one of his hidden weapons to terrorists or help them develop their own. What did Iraq have to do with what? The attack on the World Trade Center. Nothing! He said there were three main reasons for going to war in Iraq. Weapons of mass destruction. Saddam Hussein has gone to elaborate lengths spend enormous sums, taking great risks to build and keep weapons of mass destruction. The claim that Iraq was sponsoring terrorists would have attacked us on 9-11. Before September the 11th, many in the world believed that Saddam Hussein could be contained. And that Iraq had purchased nuclear materials from Niger. The regime is seeking a nuclear bomb. Now, all three of those turned out, turned out to be false. Uh, first, uh, just if I might correct, a misperception. I, I don't think we ever said, at least I know I didn't say, that there was a direct connection between September the 11th and, 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 and Saddam Hussein. Who does the president think he's effing kidding? Uh, of course, it was information that was mistaken. There are a lot of people who lie and get away with it. The information in there drawn from fact. You could find bits and pieces of fact throughout, but framed, articulated, crafted to convince someone of what? Well, of things that weren't true. Things that weren't true. 911, Al-Qaeda related to Saddam Hussein, possibly some involvement there. The liberation of Iraq is a crucial advance in the campaign against terror. We've removed an ally of Al-Qaeda. The very things that a year later, President Bush himself denies and, and feigns his surprise. I don't know why everybody thinks that. We, we, we've had no evidence that Saddam Hussein was involved with the September the 11th. Well, I worked in a place where they concentrated on, on preparing this storyline and selling it to everyone that they could possibly sell it to. It wasn't a failure of intelligence. It was the manipulation of intelligence to achieve a political goal. They were disciplined. They stayed on message. They marshaled all of their forces in this relentless public relations campaign to convince the American people that there was a threat from Iraq. It's day four of the Bush team's full court press, giving speech after speech after speech and issuing reports. The United States knows that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Any country on the face of the earth with an active intelligence program knows that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. There is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. There is no doubt that he is amassing them to use against our friends, against our allies, and against us. The choice is his, and if he does not disarm, the United States of America will lead a coalition and disarm him in the name of peace. Out of the president's mouth, vice president's mouth, uh, 
the same things that were being given to us to put into our superiors, our senior civilian leadership's mouths, these things were not based on intelligence that we saw, that everyone saw. They were based on a very selective reading of the intelligence and then a creative packaging such that you could push through these two big points that the president and the vice president and, and the whole neoconservative community used to justify this preemptive war on, on Iraq. Less than a teaspoonful of dry anthrax in an envelope shut down the United States Senate in the fall of 2001. Their policy depends on deception and secrecy, like every imperial policy in history, even dictatorships have taken great efforts always to disguise what they're doing and why they're doing it to their own people. This was never about weapons. This has always been about getting Saddam Hussein. The Bush administration knew that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and yet they continued to use the inspection process as a vehicle to achieve the ultimate goal and objective of regime change. These guys should be brought up in charges. There should be an investigation about whether these guys should be allowed to serve our country anymore. Because to me, it's criminal to say, we're gonna send our troops to war based on uh, falsified intelligence, based on puffed up, exaggerated details. <laughs> Those weapons of mass destruction gotta be somewhere. <laughs> Nope, no weapons over there. <laughs> Maybe under here. Um, I don't believe that the hype about that presentation having been the ultimate presentation, as it were, uh, that led us to war with Iraq. Uh, George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, and others had decided to go, go to war with Iraq long before Colin Powell gave that presentation. I feel like uh, it was the lowest point in my professional and personal life that I had a hand in managing it. I'm Ray McGovern, a 27-year veteran of the Central Intelligence Agency and co-founder of Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. Uh, I would like to uh, compliment you on your uh, observation that lies are fundamentally destructive of the trust that government needs to govern. A colleague of mine, Paul Pillar, who is the top agency analyst on the Middle East and on counterterrorism, accused you and your colleagues of an organized campaign of manipulation, quote, I suppose by some definition, Could you that, get to your question, that'd be please? called a lie. Atlanta, September 27, 2002, Donald Rumsfeld said, and I quote, uh, like there is bulletproof to... evidence of links between Al-Qaeda and the government of President Saddam Hussein. Was that a lie, Mr. Rumsfeld, or was that manufactured somewhere else? Because all of my CIA colleagues disputed that, and so did the 9-11 Commission. And so I would like to, to ask you to be upfront with the American people. Why did you lie to get us into a war that was not necessary and that has caused these kinds of casualties? Why? Well, first of all, I, I haven't lied. I did not lie then. <laughs> Colin Powell didn't lie. He spent weeks and weeks with the Central Intelligence Agency people and prepared a presentation that I know he believed was accurate. And he presented that to the United Nations. The President spent weeks and weeks with the Central Intelligence people. And he went to the American people and made a presentation. I'm not in the intelligence business. They gave the world their honest opinion. It appears that there were not weapons of mass destruction there. You said you knew where they were. I did not. I said I knew where suspect sites were, and you we said, were just... You said you knew where they were, near uh, Tikrit, near Baghdad, and northeast, south, and west of there. Those are your words. Before we get any deeper into uh, Iraq, you reminded me uh, of what you did in the Reagan administration. D did you sell or cause to come into the possession of Saddam Hussein weapons of mass destruction? 
did the United States sell yes. to him? Absolutely not. Did, what, did, well, did, where would anyone think that? I've did, never heard that. Did you cause him to come into the possession of chemical weapons? Of course not. He'd already used chemical weapons against his own people and against the Iranians. He was in a war with Iran where at the time. Where did he get them? He, he developed them. He, uh, Iraq's a modernized country. They have a, a high educated population. It's a big country. It's a, and, and he had used chemical weapons against the Iranians, his enemy right. that he was in a war with. Secretary Rumsfeld, as you know, we are in serious trouble in Iraq, and this war has been consistently and grossly mismanaged, and we are now in a seemingly intractable quagmire. Our troops are dying, and there really is no end in sight. And the American people, I believe, deserve leadership worthy of the sacrifices that our fighting forces have made, and they deserve the real facts. And I regret say that uh, I don't believe that you have provided either. You basically have mismanaged the war and created an impossible situation for military recruiters and put our forces and our national security in danger. Our troops deserve better, Mr. Secretary. I think the pe American people deserve better. They deserve competency, and they deserve the facts. In baseball, it's three strikes you're out. What is it for the Secretary of Defense? Mr. Secretary, I'm talking about the misjudgments and the mistakes that have made the series which I've mentioned, the disarming of the Iraqi army. Those were judgments that were made, and there have been a series of gross errors and mistakes. Those are on your watch. Those are on your watch. Isn't it time for you to resign? People are unable to discern reality from fantasy, and suddenly, you, you find people who are willing to believe in the most outrageous ideas from the earth being flat to uh, Hillary Clinton eating um, parts of young girls' brains that she bought from a pizza shop. Um, and because it's much more palatable and much more easy to believe in this craziness than it is to believe that somehow, uh, you know, uh, we've all been duped into uh, into chattel slavery the money slavery and, and, um, as a resource to be exploited and, it, and it's so palatable because um, because of the illusion that has been created um, the illusion of norm um, the illusion of the nuclear family uh, created by you know incessant uh, morality throwing down your throat by the the, uh, the, dy the nuclear dynamic of the Cosby family, you know, every week pumped into your home, uh, and and the values and morals of, of of those characters that we invite into our homes every day, every week, every night. Um, you know, this this creates this this shared morality, this shared culture. Everyone, every child in the world knows who Scooby Doo is. And, so you can export these values and ideas. And none of these ideas uh, include things that, that cause you to, to question authority at any level. So, you know, from Perry Mason to law and order, we have, a, we have an understanding of law that, that is so far from the reality of, of how our system of law was created and intended to be performed. Um, and, and we, you know, it's, it's like that with everything with absolutely everything and and that's how we live never seeing reality never seeing the world for what it really is and and when you can't do that you can't make informed decisions especially when you're not just not informed but you're deliberately misinformed on all sides of the issue even with issues that have no sides now suddenly there are sides and the media's role in all of that is to perpetuate the, uh, the, the thesis and the antithesis, and to support the synthesis that, that results. Shock runs through my spine, I cannot wait 
Can we know? Is there light in hell? When we're forced to dwell? The confusion which rules my mind Its meaning I cannot divine Nor seek it find ourselves at an interesting point in time, in history, in that um, the ruling class elites control every bit of information you consume, and, uh, and none of them are telling you the truth, and so, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the media culture is being used to, uh, to uh, guide and direct society in a direction that's uh, profitable for the, uh, the ruling class elite. Um, or the ruling class structures in, in general. Um, and so, you know, everyone's being lied to about everything at any given point in time, where at least their opinion is being made for them and people go along with it. Uh, you, you can't have a uh, discussion with anyone where they're not reciting or repeating uh, something someone's already told them uh, without having, uh, you know, explored for themselves to find the, the truth in the situation. And, um, and, and it's that way across uh, across the entirety of our of our society. We try to, to try to drive this culture, this society, into this complicit uh, vehicle of exploitation. If you have a few people in charge and they govern in the private interest, as we would say today, serving special interests, that would be bad 
And Aristotle calls that oligarchy. And by the way, I think the form of government we have today in this country is in fact oligarchy. It's government by the special interests, where our governmental institutions are just delivery systems for the special interests. So what are some of the techniques that the corporate media uses to align people to these ways of thinking, to change their basic ways of thinking and get them as a group to support the duopoly? Well, one of the interesting things is semantics, labels, open vessel words. I noticed on the, in the Mark Levin show that what he does is when he wants to give somebody a, a label, he wants to stick this name tag on them, he'll like repeat it five or six times, maybe more. He might just go, and this guy's a hemorrhoid. He's the hemorrhoid. He is a hemorrhoid. He's a hemorrhoid. Or, you know, different la other such labels. You know, they, they he, always trying to pop a label and make things stick. And they like things like, uh, you know, like Benghazi was a really cool one because I kept, I heard Benghazi during the Obama term and they repeated to death. And I'm sitting there watching all these terrible things happening and nobody's mentioning any of the things that are truly important. But you just keep hearing Benghazi, you keep hearing about emails. It's like, you know. Uh, there are, you, you don't need an artificial narrative, but then you say, well, why are they avoiding the things that are really the problems? Because the duopoly wants those particular issues. They don't want to talk about the wars. They don't want to really get ca caught up in the insanity of the wars. They don't want to get caught up in the concept of how this, this insane military uh, expansion where America's in almost every country of the world except for a handful is expensive beyond belief and that these wars are expensive beyond belief and they're they're frequently completely useless and ne net negative and they make things worse but we'll talk but you know we'll talk about uh, you know little sideshow things and we'll keep and we'll keep the wars going we'll keep you know, the uh, the codes continuing. We'll just you know we'll we'll disregard the Bill of Rights. We'll we'll never really talk about the Patriot Act. We'll just keep renewing the Patriot Act. We'll never talk about what's in the NDAA. We'll just keep renewing it, and everybody will renew it. Yeah, you know, these these two parties that are really so dissimilar, but they use labels like. One of the things is is the, is open button words. You know, they might say like, like you can say duty and honor, and these will inspire people to feel great emotions because they've filled up duty and honor with their own meaning of it and what it means to them and why it's important, why it's special, and yet. If we, if we say, well, what does duty and honor mean? Well, it probably matters a great deal who it is that's saying it. Are we talking about uh, uh, co Chinese communist concept of duty and honor? Or are we talking about uh, uh, street gangs view of it? Are we talking about uh, what ISIS refers to when they're talking about duty and honor are we uh, on and on and on I tell you, you can you, with you can take whatever group and they're not gonna see things the same way and the majority of these open vessel words and button words and different things exist that way the history of mankind is filled with wars over these words take the concept of the Almighty the Creator so you can you can get everyone to say well this is very important and this is one of the most profound things there are yet when you try to fill it in well what's going on there we like well we, we go back in time and uh, they the war of the roses they were battling over 
Catholicism and uh, Protestantism and uh, ultimately under Henry VIII he adds the Church of England because he starts uh, you know supporting Catholicism but then uh, for political reasons you know when he wishes to uh, marry a woman and make her the queen that he's going to later on kill creates the Church of England and so continue so thus continues uh, con the constant burning of people hanging head chopping drawn and quartered put on the rack all of this over which version of what the Almighty is and after Henry goes his bastard son comes in and you know that's Protestantism and then Bloody Mary comes in and now we need to uh, burn Garrett slash hack drown the Protestants because she's for the, the Catholic version and then Elizabeth comes in and oh it's another flip so these pe so people are just constantly they're killing each other over this thing that seems to be a consensus word and it happens right up to modern times with Northern Ireland uh, Northern Ireland and so yeah people you can use this word but there's there's not a consensus behind it and it's not just I just chose that England for instance but it's not there it's all over the world the the Shiite and Sunni uh, conflict yeah all over the world people have been fighting and dying over this concept you know and in, in, in all different countries the uh, the Catholic Protestant rift was very much alive in uh, Germany too and it's and so so the basis of these movements of people where they're trying to con where they're trying to control people with the corporate media they use these words and some of the old favorites and everything and what they they use these words to create a construction of how the world operates and of course conveniently it funnels people where the uh, owners of such said media would like to send them the Rupert Murdoch's and so forth and so this is this is one of the natural things that occur and this is why you get such you get such polarizing uh, visions of everything and why some why people just you know say well just they're completely wrong they're completely the, the other side is completely wrong and we're completely right and uh, there's no gray area well this is just not untrue even in stuff that's that's obvious there are gray areas even if somebody does has a policy and it's utterly wrong frequently it's true it's it was a wrong policy but it has there's some gray area and it did that it did have some benefits semantics semantics are one of the main tricks and uh, and so to lesser or greater degrees the corporate media produces things to funnel people and herd them and things that are not altogether accurate with the way the real world works
portion of the media's role in our society is the dumbing down of America, uh, the over oversimplification of, of things, um, and literally things, um, things that aren't important or relevant or true, because um, after all, you know, they, they don't want to bite the hands that feed them, them being the media, the corporate moguls, um, you know, the, the, the machine services them. Um, it's, it's often been said that the media's uh, role is to uh, keep the American public uh, informed and dumbed down um, as if we were 12 year olds. I've worked as a journalist for various different uh, media pro broadcast and print and every different magazine and newspaper have a different rule that they tell you uh, about the age level of their presumed audience and it's always much younger than, than the adults you know to be reading and so so in certain extreme cases I've been told you're writing for a, for a grade 8 audience um, at more sophisticated newspapers I've been told you're writing for a high school audience um, I know for certain broadcasters I've been told you're writing for grade 10 uh, they're terrified of alienating viewers or listeners 
and they know that if, if there are too many words people don't understand, they're going to flip to something easier. There's no doubt that um, people in the media um, and people in politics even more so uh, tend to assume that the audience are morons. My kids and they all look like me doesn't mean we have anything in common. You want your colon clean? Fine, I'm gonna clean mine. Yeah, now my colon is clean. I'm totally squeaky clean. I've never felt proud of any of my children until now. You guys want to play He Who Smelt It? Huh? This world is not yet ready for all that you will do. The time will come, Diana. And everything will be different. We're going to move for a cheeseburger. No, we got to go to the soup place. What soup place? Uh, there's a soup stand. Kramer's been going there. There's only one caveat. The guy who runs a place is a little temperamental, especially about the ordering procedure. He's secretly referred to as the soup Nazi. The hell are you supposed to be? Ari is the most sincere bachelor we've ever seen, and he is really on this journey to find his soulmate. Welcome to Paris. This is incredible. Just look at where we are. Oh, wow. really? She's totally getting put naked. Nothing sadder than watching the tail end of a career. It's basically GoFundMe for celebrities too proud to take a job at Trader Joe's. Hi, honey. Hi, honey. Hi, honey. Hi, honey. Hi, honey. Hello. I'm, I'm home. Hi, honey. Hi, honey. Smile, honey. Because I'm home. Gee, it's great to be tough on, but it's nothing like the fun that I get when I say hi, honey. I am home. Hi, honey. Hi, honey. Smile, honey. Gee, it's great to be back. Hi, honey, I'm home. Hi, honey, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> honey, I'm home. <laughs> what did I do now? Oh, tonight you will make a schnitzel. The main viewers of television are middle-aged, you know, people in their 50s and their 60s, they have time for television. They're also the part of the population that has money to spend, uh, but programs are not geared to their interests. The programs are geared to the interests of teenagers. Uh, why is that done? Well, because of studies that indicated that uh, brand loyalty is established pretty young. So if you buy a Chevrolet first, you know, chances are you'll keep buying them. Uh, so therefore, you want to gear uh, the programs, you want to dumb them down to the level of children, because then you can trap them. You're going to trap them into a kind of brand loyalty, and then you can you don't have to worry about them too much later on. And that's extremely conscious. The business world is deeply committed uh, to try to induce people to become completely stupid, uh, to trying to impose on people a philosophy of futility uh, and to focus their attention on the superficial things of life, like fashionable consumption, uh, so as to keep them controlled, passive, atomized, uh, direct their lives to uh, uh, amassing the commodities.
Mr. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. You're putting me on. No, it's pronounced Frankenstein. Do you also say Froderick? No, Frederick. Well, why isn't it Froderick Frankenstein? It isn't, it's Frederick Frankenstein. I see. You must be Igor. No, it's pronounced Igor. But they told me it was Igor. Well, they were wrong then, weren't they? Oh.